jamming out here. Well, a very good morning to everyone this morning. morning. How is everyone? Awesome. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We've got a lot of things to be happy about. Um, look at all the nice weather we've had. Okay, I'll apologize up front. I brought the bad weather back with me because we had storms all last week, thunderstorms and rain every day. And, and so when I came home, it just kind of followed along with me. So I'll apologize up front for that. Welcome for everyone who's able to be here today. We've got a couple I know that were under the weather, so to speak. And so they won't be with us here today. Thank you for joining us online as well this morning. Um, very excited about uh, some possibilities of some things coming up. And uh, so I'll be able to share those with you hopefully shortly. Um, as we journey through our Is Genesis History series in here, uh, awesome, awesome information that it has in there. Um, so this last Wednesday, if you missed what we had, uh, you can click online, go into our website and check, click on the Is Genesis History. You can go back and review the video. So it's a six week study. We've already, believe it or not, finished half of it. So it's awesome, awesome study. So this week is going to be man, life, and science, the doctrine of the image of God. And so uh, Pastor Terry's kind of kind of teases with that this morning in his message. And then uh, we have Adam and Eve in the first sin coming up, the global flood and the importance of history. And there's a lot of people who, you know, as you're going through school, I know I didn't have the greatest experience in history going through school. Uh, as a matter of fact, my teacher one time didn't like my comments that he made. He was one of these old school kind of guys. He came over and we had these wooden desks and he just come over and he yanked up on the front of it. He was an old Marine. Flipped me over, flipped me out of my desk the whole bit because I made some comments about history and he wasn't too happy about it because he loved history. However, I kind of changed my perspective on history. Once I had a different teacher, um, I no seriously, we changed teachers for some odd reason. And... Uh, <laughs> This other teacher really got me interested on why history was so important. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of followed me then on, and I really started getting into history, looking up things and learning why history was so important. So much so that at the History Center, I started building exhibits for the History Center downtown. And so it's really neat to see all the little nuances and things that we, you never really know, you never really learn until you start building pieces for museums. Mm -hmm. And then you learn all of this rich history. You can't believe mm -hmm. the stuff that Cedar Rapids has gone through and the changes that it's gone through, mm -hmm. what it's grown from and how important it was as a hub here in the Midwest for all of the states around us. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's amazing when we take a look at history. And so that's, that's why I kind of like this is Genesis history, because we can go back to the very beginning mm -hmm. and see why this is so important for us as the foundation for our belief system. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we uh, look forward to the rest of this study. Coming up then, September 10th, we have Orange Track Racing again. And it just seems like we just got done having this, and uh, it was so much fun. We had a lot, we had a really good time this last time around as well. Tulsa, the movie, September seventeenth. Invite everybody you know, and we'll buy more Kleenexes. Um, but it's it's kind of a neat movie. I like it. If you haven't seen the trailer for it, uh, stick around. We'll be showing that movie free September seventeenth, six o'clock right here and uh, what I really like about this it's not your typical movie like we've shown in the past and it's really and I'm not gonna spoil it but boy there's there's a little bit of a surprise at the very ending on here which really will sh truly show you the change in a person's heart um, and a change in their lives as well 
So it is truly a life-changing movie from that perspective. So I really look forward to, to that movie coming up. It's a, it's a great, great movie. So let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer as we start our time of worship this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this day, for the ability to gather together freely and openly in your name and to bring praise, glory, and honor to you here, dear Lord. We ask that you would open up our hearts today to receive your message, our ears to hear, our eyes to see the wonders and the glories of this, of this earth, this planet, these people, and this church that you have built. Lord, help us to understand your mysteries. Reveal them to us as we come into that relationship with you. Lord, we just praise you and thank you that you have blessed Pastor Terry with a message today. And we just ask that you would just make it resound in our hearts. So as we come together here in worship this morning, we just bring all praise, honor, and glory to you. In your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 8 from the New Living Translation. And it says, Our, our Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. And you have taught the children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them, yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, and the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. And this just speaks to the writer of this psalm when he wrote this. He's referring back, of course, to Genesis 2. And uh, the creation story where God turns over the domain of all of the creatures and all of earth and everything that he created, he turned it over to man to have him work it and to make it prosper. And we were given an awesome gift. And at the same time, we were taxed with an awesome, awesome stewardship of what he had given us. We were tasked with responsibilities. He says, okay, I created all these things for you. Now, bring me honor and glory by keeping and being good stewards of what I've created. Well, as in many things, we've fallen down on a lot of our responsibilities to be good stewards of what has been gifted to us. And we have to take a look at that with open eyes when we come into this. And we have to understand that God placed us here. To bring honor and glory to him and so in everything that we do in taking care of everything that he has created we need to understand that that is for us to bring honor and glory that's our purpose in life and being in community with each other and having that bond and that relationship that god created us to have with one another was to lift each other up to edify and build and strengthen each other in community with one another we serve an awesome God, don't we? Mm -hmm. Gracious Lord, as we prepare our hearts to hear your message this morning that Pastor Terry is bringing forth this morning, Lord, we just we just ask that you would uh, bless us to our fullest extent today. Help us to understand what our purpose in life is, what you have created on this earth, and what our responsibilities are to be able to take care of that. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us these things, these gifts. Help us to be good stewards at all time. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. 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 Every once in a while I get prompted by God. You know, I've, I've talked about Psalm 4610 quite a bit over the last several weeks because it's just um, centering. God said, I want you to center your people on Sunday morning. So I'm going to mute my mic because I don't want to be too loud. But I want you all to join me. Um, we all 
don't need to stop the recording or anything since it's not a video. We can actually sing this, but we'll just sing it uh, on the <laughs> Mark said we're going to get into man, life, and science. Boy, those can uh, rattle a few people, but it's all about the doctrine of the image of God. And in the first week of the series, we looked at whether or not G Genesis was actually history, and through it, how God revealed himself to us. And then last week, Pastor Mark brought us a message about the first seven days and how God created the heavens and the earth. And this week, we're going to look at man. We are created in the image of God. And we're going to look at life. And next, yeah, next week we're going to get into this more. But life changed the moment sin entered the world. Before sin entered, there was a completely different mm -hmm. dynamic between God and his creation. And then certainly we'll touch a little bit on science. Is it compatible with the Bible? So as we look at man, life, and science, we're going to look at how they all relate back to the image of God. Now, are we going to be able to get into a full-on uh, description of the image of God? Not unless y'all want to be here all week. And I would have to tag team with Mark. We'd do like a, it'd almost be like a filibuster where I would uh, give the floor to Mark and then he would give it back. <laughs> For all of you that like politics and history. But the thing is, is that we are uniquely created by God in His image. And yes, that did change after the fall. And since the fall, there's been some bumps and bruises and we've been tarnished a little bit. But we are still made in the image of God. I kind of liken it like... Uh, you know, he's driving down the road, you see some of these cars, you remember how nice they used to look when they were new, but they've got all these dings in them. They're still made in, in the same image in which the manufacturer designed it. It's just they've been bumped and bruised a little bit. And this morning we're going to take a look at both uh, the accounts in Genesis 1 and the account in Genesis 2 and talk about some of the questions that arise around the creation of us. So they do start differently. In Genesis chapter 1, we get, and Mark read this last week, and it's a, basically a real good summary of what God did every single day, day 1 through day 7. And you didn't have to talk about day 7 all that much because what did he do? He rested. So the, the real one that I want to talk about is, we talked about some of the differences though, is in on day 3. So in chapter 1, it says, Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. But in Genesis 2.5, it says, Neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. Are those compatible? Didn't God create all those things on day 3? Get into that a little bit more here in a moment. Another question that came up was, how was everything in Genesis 2 created in one day? So, this is the list. Kind of a laundry list of everything. I, and I can't imagine God needed a checkbox of, you know, list, because I do, but I know he didn't. But God, man formed from the ground, fully grown. Mm -hmm. And then the Garden of Eden, in which... The Lord planted a garden, and he said, made all sort of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. 
Then it says that he created the wild animals and the birds of the air, who were then all named by Adam. I didn't put anything in here, and I didn't know if I was going to, but does it not bother you? When you think of all the different species of animals that are out in the world today, doesn't it kind of bother your mind that Adam did that all in a day? Sandwiched by God creating Adam and all the the garden and everything in it, and then on the other side of it, he created and then the animals, and then he had Adam name them. But yet, he still hadn't done one other thing. And that was to create woman from the rib of man. How did he do it? And and I was reading a, a real interesting thought process on this, how it could have been done all in one day, and it might have happened all in maybe about a three or four hour time span in which he named all the animals, because all he had to do was name the specific species. He didn't have to get into everything underneath of it. So think of a horse. How many different types of horses are there? So think of dogs. How many different types of dogs are there? And then, you know, go on top of that, and we read poodles with Labradors and got Labradoodles. So, he didn't have to go to that full extent of naming every single piece because it was the species that he named, not each individual animal. Now, again, we need to be careful, and I, I, I went down a rabbit hole again. I said this <laughs> two weeks ago, and they did again, where I got to be careful because next week Mark's going to be on Adam and Eve and the first sin, the doctrine of the fall. So we'll kind of stop right there. But here's something, another question for you, rhetorical, nobody needs to answer, but why are the ways that the first two chapters start important? Chapter one, Moses is giving us that daily summary of what happened each day. In chapter two, he's going into a more detailed account of the sixth day, that, because it was an important it gives us some understanding of our history. And this was a common practice amongst the Hebrew histories. They would give a general overview first, and then they would give a more detailed account that is evident throughout the scriptures with them. So this leads us to another important difference, God's name. In chapter 1, the Hebrew word Elohim is used referring to God as the infinite and all-powerful creator. In chapter 2, two Hebrew words are used, Yahweh and Elohim, which refers to God in a personal way. So when we look at the summary of the first chapter, we see God, the all-powerful creator, and in the second chapter, we see him as uh, a friend, as, as our creator, as the Father God. So hopefully you're starting to see why the questions about these differences in the chapters are important. It is really more than a detailed account and a personal relationship between God and us that comes out in this second chapter. So let's take some time and do a quick overview of day three from chapter one. So this is going to be Genesis 1, verses 9 through 13. And then it says, Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so the dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the water seas, and God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that's what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit, and their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good, and evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. So then now we need to resolve that with what it says in Genesis chapter 2. And this is, in the NLT, the verse 4 gets broken up a little bit differently some of the other verses. It's now there's no doctrinal change there, it's just how it was translated. So we'll start in the second half of verse 4 through 5. It says, When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, 
and there were no people to cultivate the soil. So Genesis 1.11, God is speaking plants and trees into being. In Genesis 5, the words translated wild plants and grains are different than what was used in Genesis 1. It's Saya and Esep. Esep refers to plants like barley and wheat and other grains that require cultivation by man to grow his crops. And Saya refers to wild growing plants. So think weeds and thorns and thistles and all the stuff that if you do gardens, even if you do a potted garden like what we have, you still get the weeds in it. You still have to you know, get the, rid of them. And the reason for the difference here is Remember what it said here in, in verse, uh, verse 5, it said, For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to our the earth, and there was no people to cultivate the soil. So there was no one yet created, God had not created man to take care of the essence. So that's where the difference comes. And I have to imagine because we don't, it's not called out in the scripture, but I have to imagine that the Saya didn't exist until after the fall. Because as Mark will talk about next week, that's when the ground becomes hard to work. Now we could go into a lot more detail as this is, it does this, but we're gonna do that on Wednesday night because um, I don't wanna keep you here. Mark likes to teach, you know, those four hour sermons. We'll just try to keep it to three. Uh, but this helps us to really truly understand the intricate interconnectedness that exists between man, life, and science. God created all of this for not himself, but for us. So last week we talked about how man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for the man. I want to change that up a little bit. I want to say man was not made for the garden. The garden was created for garden then we'll put man in it then then he created woman mm -hmm. this is important as we talk about the doctrine of the image of god because god made all the different plants animals the birds the fishes and on and on and on each producing offspring of the same kind god then created adam and eve in his image and as their descendants that means that we are also created in his image now that is what makes us different from every other part of God's creation. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means that we share a unique spiritual quality with God. There's three pieces to that. There's the moral, which our world is kind of off the rails on. It creates rational. Oh, we're also off the rails on that. And it created intelligent, an intelligent connection. Not quite so off the rails with that, but the other two are pulling it off the rails. But what else did it give us? It gave us an ability to express ourselves. So I'm expressing myself saying that we're off the rails. <laughs> other people might not agree. But here's the thing. If we think about those things, moral, rational, intelligent, to express ourselves what does that get us to that gets us all the way into um, Paul's teaching when he talks about the fruits of the spirit which he talks about what love joy peace patience kindness faithfulness goodness gentleness and self-control might be a little out of order of what Paul had written on but we got them all and here's the one that, and I, I got it, you know Paul wrote this on purpose, he put love first. Mm -hmm. he, it's all about a personal and loving relationship with God our Creator. And we do that. How do we do that? We express do that by expressing it through worship. Now, is worship Sunday morning? Yes. Can you worship every other day of the week without opening your Bible even? You worship by dedicating everything that you do so yes, we do worship all the time. So let's talk about three things the Bible teaches us about the image of God. We are created in God's image. So Adam and Eve were created in God's image. They were fully formed. 
And I don't know why it just popped in my head. I gotta imagine they didn't have belly buttons. <laughs> that would just look weird. <laughs> came from I'm sorry they were fully formed so that they could fulfill their work of understanding manipulating and overseeing the creation under God's personal involvement I'm going to say that again they we were created to understand to manipulate not in a bad way and oversee what the creation we were given that responsibility. We were designed to work. And if we go back to our previous mm -hmm. series, Mark even had a sermon on that where he talked about we were designed to work. We were designed to labor. We just made it worse when, you know, the fault. Mm -hmm. But we do all that under God's personal involvement. Now let's look at Genesis 2, 4 through 9 in whole here. It says, This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth. And there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good skip a few verses and go to verse 15 and it says the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it Adam was made to watch over the garden of Eden but the Lord God warned him you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil if you eat its fruit you are sure to die then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. See, he didn't make eat of it right away. He created the animals and the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave the names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still... There was no helper just right for him. I'm on off script here because I, I think when we are young and we don't think about it and we aren't, we don't really pay attention to what we're doing, we tend to find a helper who we think is right for us, but do we seek God in doing that and make sure that we're getting the right person? See, God knows the right person. And in this instance, he created her just for him. Verse 21 continues saying, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. And this is what he said. At last the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. So God created, or we are created in God's image, and they were given three distinct capabilities. Relational. They were created to communicate, not just with God, but with each other. And relational also means that they were uh, they had the ability to, to reason, because Adam would have had to have had reasons why he named the animals. Every name that he used to, for the animals had a reason and went with what that animal was for. And then also the ability to love. God created us to love, whether it was each other or 
as we, that's what we want here is for that to happen to both. He also gave those uh, moral capabilities, the ability to obey and disobey him. He gave us free will. He gave us the opportunity to choose, good or bad. He also gave us dominion, and that, that's the ability to discern the purpose and nature of plants and animals, and that's what Adam used when he named them. God also established mutual relationships. So God the Father, Adam the Son of God, the scriptures even call it out as Adam being the son of God. If you look at Luke 3.38, it says, under Jesus' ancestors, it says, Adam, the son of God, as it's going through the ancestry there. God created Eve to be Adam's partner. And then, what did God do? He commanded them to, what comes out of Genesis 1.20, it says, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground. He gave them, and he takes us back to that word dominion. He gave us dominion over all of his creation. In those first two sentences, we see that God also had designed us to work together as one. This was not just for them, but also for their descendants, meaning us. Jesus would, in Matthew 19, identify this as the first marriage. He would go on to teach that marriage was between a man and a woman, and it is the foundation of all civilization. From then to he returns. That means there is a hierarchy to the created universe. Now in Psalm 8 from our call to worship this morning, the psalmist recognizes that there is an order in the universe. And the psalmist recognizes that we, you and me, are unique. But we're nothing more than human. We're not omnipotent, meaning we're not all-powerful. We're not omniscient, meaning we're not all-knowing. We're certainly not omnipresent because we can't be everywhere always, all the time. We're not unchanging. Unfortunately, we're not all good. Even those of us who think we're good, we're still not good all the time. But the list from there goes on and on and on. In this psalm, the writer gives us a glimpse of the way God had intended for things to be. So as you think about how God intended things to be, listen to the reading of verses 1 through 9 again. It says, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care about them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our God, your majestic name fills the earth. The psalmist is reiterating that we have dominion over everything that God has created. Now, quite frankly, that's quite a bit of responsibility. We sometimes have a hard enough time taking care of ourselves. Out of the house, did I use deodorant? Did I brush my teeth? <laughs> did I remember my keys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a lot of responsibility, and, and we are to use what God has created, but we need to preserve what God has created for those who will come after us. We can't use it all up, we can't make it so that there's nothing left. And in this section of the study, it poses the question, what happens when we replace the word creation with the word environment? The word environment does not point us back to God, who is the creator, which is what creation does. So, 
think of these two statements. I'm going to make two statements. I'm going to think of, I want you to think in your mind which one of these elicits a more emotional response to you. We need to take care of the environment. We need to take care of creation. Which one elicits a more emotional response to you? God entrusted us with the responsibility of taking care of his creation. And so for me, as I thought about that, as I'm writing the sermon this week, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what are we doing by making the environment instead of creation? So if we think about creation, God put us in charge of it. But if we think about the word environment, does that take and elevate that above us? Are we more concerned about the environment than we are ourselves? Mm -hmm. And if so, then we aren't taking care of creation because we have lowered ourselves. Mm -hmm. To take care of God's creation, we need to use the knowledge that science gives us to the very best of our abilities because we were given dominion over his creation. It's not just creation that needs to be protected, though. We need to protect the image of God. So the image of God must be protected. And to protect the image of God, man must be protected from those who want to destroy it. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Satan will stop at nothing. He will stop at nothing to take out as many people as he can as absolutely possible. Now, in studying for the, the, the message, the one thing I found overwhelmingly is that murder is Satan's primary weapon. Now, murder elicits a whole, you know, whole thought process for you, right? Murder can mean more than that, though. It can mean more than unlawfully taking someone's life, which is what the definition is. There's also another definition, and it can also mean to put an end to something or to defeat it badly. So, have you ever heard uh, a young person say, I murdered it? <laughs> or, you know, the, the baseball, mm -hmm. somebody hits it and they hit it so hard and so far that somebody says, he murdered that ball. Mm -hmm. Totally different connotation to murdering, taking someone's life, but yet coming together. So, while Adam and Eve did not die the moment they ate the fruit, Satan put an end to the way that God had intended our lives to be. So in a sense, he murdered that vision. So protecting the image of God is of the utmost importance. This is why God gave... Well, this is why we see such extreme consequences to actions when we, when we look at Scripture. If we look at Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 7, it says this, And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And if anyone who murders a fellow human being must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image, and now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. And this is what... Uh, in this sense, this is what God is telling to Noah and his sons and their families as they were getting off the ark. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit later, too. Mm -hmm. I dropped that right where I was at. But just as God blessed Adam and Eve and told them to be fruitful and multiply, he told the same thing to Noah and his sons. Because what was left after the flood? Noah and his sons. Mm -hmm. And as we saw in the movie, everything changed. Everything changed. What you know when we talked, to, when we listened to uh, Dr. Tackett, and as they were going through some of the explanations of like the Grand Canyon and how it was not just a slow erosion because it wouldn't exist as it does. It was a catastrophic event that made that happen. But filling the world with God's people means filling the world with God people God created in his image. So as we, as he's doing that, you know, the more people that fill the earth with his image, the greater glory comes to God. 
and before the flood, you know, that was, it was terrible, even the animals and the people, that was just awful. It's got to be better now, but even now it's awful <laughs> when you think about it. We have to take what it means to be created by God's image very much to heart. of who we are. It is foundational to absolutely every aspect of our lives. This is so important. It's foundational to every aspect of our lives. Think about that as we go through the rest of our service music here at the end and, and communion and prayers for the people, how foundational being created in God's image is. Father, you created us in your image. You created us to have dominion over all of creation. You created us to turn to you in every aspect because we didn't turn to you the fall happened but throughout scripture you take the time you, you take such intimate time with us to show us how when we do not walk in your way when we do not seek you when we do not exude your image, what will happen. But you also show us, by the same token in those scriptures, what you will do when we do call upon your name. When we call upon your name, Father, you are there. You are there to protect us, to guide us, and to lead us in the things that we should do and say and places that we should go. Father, as we take time today and into the, the future and really digging into and understanding why it's so, founda so foundational for us to understand that we are created in your image and likeness so that we can share online, however that is, Father. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. As we come into this time of communion this morning, the communion, the act of communion is a time to remember, and it's a time to remember uh, what Jesus brought to us. He was calling his disciples together at the final meal that he was going to be able to share with them before he was led off to be crucified. And we are called to remember not only just uh, that act of salvation that Christ was going to do for us, but we were called to actually remember Jesus' time on earth. As we heard in the message today, you know, we, we became a fallen people. We went against God's will. We broke that relationship between man and God at the fall. And so what did God do? He created the second Adam, Jesus, to come and live amongst us. But moreover, to give us that example of a pure life, a pure life without sin, and a living example of that, yes, it's possible for us to live a sinless life in the example of Christ. So as we take communion together, as we gather together here in communion with each other, we are called to remember that yes, we can live a sinless life. We can follow that example of Christ. And through his death on the cross, he gives us salvation, that opportunity to be forgiven of the sins that we've already created in our life by our true and only actions. By our choice. 
And that through that salvation, man, we are cleansed, we are made whole, and we are restored with God. Our relationship with God is restored. So as we come into this time of communing today, I just want you to pause for just a moment and really think about this as, as we're partaking in the blood and the juice, the body and the blood of Christ, what it really means to have communion and to remember everything that was done. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you, salvation. Later on in the meal, he took the cup, and after he filled it, he blessed it, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink. And as the scriptures tell us, as we gather together, we are to take the bread and the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and share it with each other, in communion with each other as a remembrance of the sacrifice. But not only the sacrifice, but of the example that Christ set for us, his living example, and that we are to follow that. Remember to follow that example of Christ as we go through each and every day. Thanks be to God. body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. And good morning. For the people, would anybody like to ask for prayer for anybody? Yeah. Harold, 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 you are our rock and our redeemer, our tower of refuge in, when, in whom we run to in times of trouble, frustration, anxiety, sadness. You give us words of wisdom to live by when we open the Bible, living words of hope when we feel depressed and anxious for the future. In Romans 8.26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that works, words cannot express. So, Father God, let your Holy Spirit rest in this house this morning. May you be ever-present among us as we honor you with praise and worship. And, Father God, I would like to lift up Terry's family and his dad, Al. I pray that they can find a suitable place for Al to live that will give him comfort and suit his needs where he can enjoy his life and be able to interact with others according to your will for him. I would like to pray for Becky, for her right knee and shoulder. Um, she can't get into the doctor yet for injections, Lord, but you are the great physician. And you can heal her if you choose. I just pray that you will, um, that the blood of Jesus wash over her, Lord God, <clears throat> and comfort her through this time. Help her to get the help that she needs to recover, and um, let your will be done, Lord Jesus. And I ask for prayers for Don and Denny and Harold and Doug, <clears throat> that you intercede for any and all needs that they have, for pain, for healing, for work, for rest. Lord, just cover them with the blood of Jesus and do a mighty miracle in their lives. Let your will be done in them always. Thank you, Jesus, for the many blessings you bestow upon each and every one of us every day. And I would like to pray for the people of Utah and Kentucky that have had the floodwaters raging against them. I pray the people would gather together to help one another get through each day. I pray this crisis will bring them closer to you, that they would start to praise and honor you in all things, 
so that you will restore their homes and businesses. I ask that Christians will rise up throughout this country and proclaim your word to others, that we will have a revival of hearts and minds. Restore our country back to you, O oh God, for only then will there be peace among us. Help us to acknowledge you in all things. Help us to let your will be done in our lives and not our own will. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness in all things. By your power and love, give us hope for the future. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As always, if you do have a prayer request and you're watching online, please leave it for us in the comments of the video as Becky did so that we can make sure that you are prayed over. As we close this portion of our service, the online portion, I'm going to read this prayer of praise that comes from almost the end of the, the book. It comes from Jude. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time.